Good morning. My name is Tom Rellinger and I'm with Rochester University. Grateful to be with you here today at the Naperville Church of Christ. And it's been probably a couple of years since I've had an opportunity to come over to the Chicago area. I look forward to uh, that time when maybe things open up again and, and I can get back out on the road and get out to some of the churches again. I miss seeing each of you and have an opportunity to interact with each of you. I want to spend some time today kind of going through scripture with you and maybe sharing a word that I hope will bless you as I've been blessed as I've looked at this text anew, uh, something that I hadn't looked at maybe in a while. I want to start by asking just a couple of questions or making a few observations as we begin, and then we're going to open up our Bibles to James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Faith is fragile. I say that because I know in my own life there are times that, that faith can be like a turtle shell. It can be hard as an exterior, maybe the top of a turtle shell that Things can't break through when maybe I need to let things break through. Or maybe the underside of the turtle shell where faith is maybe exposing components of my life that need to be exposed and that are maybe easily prodded or affected in a certain way. But faith can be very fragile at times. Faith can also be something that's molded. When I think of that, I think of something like Play-Doh, where you take that lump of Play-Doh and you, you, you put it in a little container that's got maybe an attachment of some kind, and you push down on it, and you put all that pressure along it, and all of a sudden, out the other side comes a new shape or a new form or an, an animal figure of some kind. I'm pretty familiar with Play-Doh because I have a two-and-a-half-year-old grandson that he really likes to play with Play-Doh. But it reminds me, though, that faith can be molded. It can be shaped. I'm reminded of, well, that, that God has a desire to shape each, each of us. God has a desire to move you to become and to look like, more like his son Jesus in your daily life. He wants your attitude to be like Jesus. He wants your speech to be like Jesus. He wants things in your life just all-encompassing to be like Jesus. And I'm convinced of this, that there are times where God says, I'm going to allow you to go through trials so that I might press on you a little bit, or I might allow the trial to press upon you in such a way that it might shape you to be something different on the other end of that trial. I know this. I know that wherever you're at today in your life, you're probably in one of three categories. You're either you're experiencing trial right now, you're in it, or you're just now coming out of trial of some kind, or you're about to enter into trial of some kind. You're in one of those three places in your life. You're either in trial, coming out of trial, or you're about to head into trial. Jesus said in, in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, I, I came into this world to give you peace, but in this world you will have many trials. In 2 Timothy 3.12, uh, Paul was writing Timothy, and he reminded Timothy, he said, anybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Trials are inescapable. Trials are what you and I are going to experience. How we live through those trials says the world about who we are. I want to ask that you would pray with me at this time, and then we're going to open up to the book of James. Father, thank you for loving us and caring for us and for giving us this word. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus. Thank you for giving us the gift of your spirit to live into our lives, to help shape and mold us, Lord. I pray, Father, that your spirit would be with us today in this word, in my speech, and in the hearts of all who are listening. We ask this prayer through the name of Jesus, and together we say, amen. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be given to him. 
But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. Frida Lesher was 85 years old when I met her in 1996. She's the matriarch, or she was the matriarch at the church that I came to pastor to be the minister at in Northern Michigan. When I left in 2011, we arrived in 1996, left in 2011, Frida was just about to turn 101. We used to chuckle in the community because we had several members of our church that were in their upper 90s and over 100 years old, two members over 100 years old. People used to say all the time, go to Tom's church. You never die when you go to Tom's church. Of course, you and I both understand it never was Tom's church, never is Tom's church, never will be Tom's church, but you, you get the meaning. Frida was the first person baptized in the Petoskey Church of Christ in 1962, 51 years old. 51 years old, she had married earlier in her life. Her husband was 34 years older than she was when she married. Needless to say, she lost her husband early in her marriage. Frida had a few children and she had to go to work and she worked at a place and this were her term, not my term. She said, I worked at the poor farm, Tom, the county poor farm. It was the place in our community that if you didn't have a place to live or food that you could take care of yourself, it's where you went. Frida had over a hundred residents there that she cooked for. She was the only cook for that facility. Six days a week, she worked 12 to 14 hours a day, preparing food, three meals a day for over 100 residents. She got one day off a week. They gave her Sundays off. And on that one day, she would do her own laundry. And on that one day, she would do her own cooking for the week. And on that one day, she'd do any errands that she needed to take care of because Frida had to work for several years, six days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day. The remarkable thing about Frida for me was this. When I met her, she lived at a place called the River Bend, an assisted living facility. She was already 85. And the first time I met her, somebody came in the room and was bringing her lunch on a tray. And they put that tray down and she looked at me and she said, Tom, she said, this is the best food. Now, I didn't know her story yet about what she had done in her life, but she just had this attitude about her that life is good. Did you know something else, Tom? She said, they'll even help me do my laundry here at this facility. Can you believe that? They bring my food and they do my laundry for me. Frida had this contagious atmosphere about her, attitude about her, I should say. And, and in this, in this attitude was just, she was going to give praise. She was going to be thankful for whatever circumstance she found herself in. Frida always had to have a ride to church from somebody because she didn't drive anymore and she came to church faithfully. And whenever Frida would speak, you just listened because you knew there was something behind her words. There was some wisdom that she had through years of learning things and experiencing things that many of us had never experienced or had never learned yet in our lives. There were multiple times, and I could say this as God is my witness, that I would be praying about things and thinking of phrases that I was praying about, and Frida would be in a Bible class, and she would say that phrase out loud, not knowing what I was praying about, and I knew, I knew for a fact that whatever came out of her mouth next, because that phrase was like the introduction, that I needed to listen, because this most likely was a word from the Lord that I needed to hear. She was remarkable at how many people she spoke into their lives. She truly was the matriarch of our church. Gifted, Gifted in her ability to see life differently than many of us wanted to see life. You just knew that you did not dare complain in front of Frida Lesher. You knew the life she had experienced and you knew better to talk about your aches and your pains and the job that you didn't like that you had, the job that you only had to work eight to nine hours at and you got really good pay for. You didn't dare complain about those things in front of Frida because Frida knew something very different from that but she learned to experience life differently. And I always wondered what it was in Frida's life that allowed her to look at the trials that she experienced and she just looked at it differently than many of the rest of us. And I think it started for Frida real similar to where it starts for James 
in this book as well. In James chapter 1, James verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, one of the first things that James does when he starts this letter is he tells you who he is. He's first and foremost, he's a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know for a fact that's how Frida lived out her life. She believed, first of all, that I'm a servant of God, and it changed her perspective on how she thought of life and everything that was happening to or with her in life as well. As a servant of God, she, she committed herself to live subserviently under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so if God determined that this was her lot, who is she to question God? She was God's servant. And I forget that point sometimes, and I wonder if you might as well. We forget the point that we've said to ourselves, Jesus is Lord of my life. And if he's Lord, that means he's master and I'm not. And if he's Lord and things happen in my life, who am I to question why they should happen? Of course, you say, Tom, that's kind of silly. You, you can't make me believe that you can go through life without just questioning God. No, maybe not questioning God, but, but really understanding that he truly is in control of you and I's lives. And then James says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish the work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's that, it's that verse there, consider it pure joy, my brothers, that I struggle with, and I wonder if you might as well. Scripture reminds us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that Jesus considered it joy, knowing that the cross was something he yet had to endure. Look at Hebrews 12, 2 with me for a moment. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right, the right hand of the throne of God. How is it that Jesus could look at what was about to happen to him on Friday, the day of crucifixion, and the scripture says, considered it joy? This idea that, 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 that he could, uh, for the joy set before him, endure something that was about to happen. You see, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the crucifixion day that Jesus was contemplating the joyful response. It was the resurrection day that Jesus was looking towards. It wasn't hanging on a cross and the shame and the scorn and the physical abuse that he was about to take. It was knowing what was going to happen two days later of that day or the third day that he arises again. It was crucifixion, yes, but it was resurrection day that made him think of joy. It was the end of the process that gave him that joy. He knew what God was going to do as an end result. And you see, that's, that's the James passage. That's really what James is saying here in chapter one. He's saying to us, listen, you need to understand that when you're going through trials, you consider it pure joy, not in the moment, but you're thinking about what God is about to do for you. What God is going to do in shaping you and molding you and trusting that God being Lord of your life, Jesus being Lord of your life, is going to mold and shape you through this trial experience. We think at times this. We think trials are to be avoided. They're not. Trials are to be endured. It's temptations later on in James that's to be avoided. Because temptation gives rise to your own evil desires, and your own evil desires then give rise to sin. Temptations are to be avoided, but trials are to be endured. Jesus was tempted in all ways like you and I, but he was without sin. And so Frida understood this whole concept of, I'm going to get through the trial because I know who the Lord of my life is, and I know the Lord's got something better for me on the other end of this. And we don't place ourselves in that category very often. We're always looking at the moment to define how we're going to respond to something. James is telling us to look past that. Look past what's going on so you can see what's really happening, what God could potentially do. I don't even think of my life sometimes in the way that I think God wants me to think of it. I'm already living in eternity. Church, are you? Are you already living in eternity? Are you thinking of, of life here as one part of what's going on in your existence, and then eternity is something that happens after this physical life? I challenge you to say maybe you need to reframe that a little bit and, and, and recalibrate that and say, I'm already living in eternity. 
When I took on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life, he already promised me a forever. I'm already living in that promise of foreverness. It doesn't go away because I live or die. That promise of foreverness is always there for you and I. You see, there, there's trouble in this world all around us, isn't there, church? I mean, we, we're living through scenarios right now where it's hard to, to picture the journey because we're so focused on the moment. We're living through COVID right now. We're living through a political season that's got us all in this upheaval state of mind of what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. We're living through uh, 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 scenarios where um, uh, the economics of what's going on are, are, are making a struggle to see what's really coming out on the other side. We don't know what's going to happen. We're living with uh, uh, the exposure of, of, of racism now coming to the forefront, the structural racism that's in our society coming out, creating the tension within our communities, the tension within our cities, the tension within families and stuff. And it's time that we dealt with the structural racism. All these things are issues and trials that we have to work through to say what's on the other side. And it's only through God, it's only through us submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus that we can really push ourselves in the understanding that there is something on the other end of all these trials that is much better. But it starts. It starts with us understanding who the Lord of our life is. It starts with us understanding that we can look at things with joy as much as they're filled with tension, as much as they're filled with hardship. There's something on the other side that God has promised us. I had another fellow at church. His name was Will. And um, Will struggled with being a little obsessive compulsive. We had a very unique church up north. We just seemed to cater to a lot of folks that struggled um, out on the streets. And so our church was very chaotic when you'd come together on a Sunday morning with uh, just different people that, uh, frankly, might make some people a little bit nervous from time to time. But Will was one of those guys I was taking one time to a doctor's appointment. We were driving from our little community of Petoskey to the community of Charlevoix. Well, you can't be more than 10, 12 miles apart. And 22 times... Will reached over and grabbed the steering wheel while I was driving. He'd see a car coming down the road, and, and he'd think we were just too close to that center line. He'd reach right over and grab the steering wheel and just kind of move me back a little bit. And finally, it got to where it nerved me. I'm a fairly patient individual. I pulled over to the side of the road. I said, Will, we got to get one three thing straight. I'm driving this car, and my hands are on the steering wheel. You're sitting over there, and your hands are going to be underneath your rump because you're not going to grab that steering wheel one more time because I can't handle that anymore. You need to understand who's driving and who's not driving. And you know the analogy that I'm going to leap to here. You can see it coming, right? That we do that with God all the time. We go to walk up onto the journey. We go to walk up into the trial. We go to walk up to get into the car. And we actually wrestle with God as to who's going to drive. And you say to yourself, well, I don't do that. I let God drive. Over. No, you don't. You reach right over and you grab that steering wheel 22 times during the midst of your trial because you want to tell God exactly how to get there and tell God exactly where to the center line he needs to be. And God is saying, get your hands off of my steering wheel. And we have to remember that when we're really turning our lives over to the Lord, we're saying we're going to let God press and mold us because faith can be fragile. Faith needs to be molded. Faith needs to be something that God has uh, control of in your life to help you understand that he's got a journey he's taking you on and he's going to bring you somewhere but you got to let him drive. And you got to understand that the destination is worth the trial. It's worth the enduring moments that you have to go through in your life. But you got to give it to the Lord to be able to do that. Too many times in this passage when we've looked at it, we've all looked at this, this wording here. It says, but you know, if you're lacking something, if you lack wisdom, you know, you don't know how to get through the trial, you should just ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It'll be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. You know, so many times I've looked at that passage and I've thought, yeah, I've got to have faith enough to ask for the, the wisdom that I need and just believe that God's going to give it to me to be able to get through the trial that I'm going through. I'm convinced of this now in my life. I think this passage could also be interpreted as this, that when you do ask, not only should you believe and not doubt. In other words, if God gives you the wisdom, if God gives you the answer, believe the answer. Sometimes in our lives, we do this to God. He, he shows right up and tells us exactly what the answer is. And we say, but that's not the answer, God. I don't want to do that. I don't want to respond that way. I don't want to have to go 
finish this task that you've asked me to do. I don't want to have to go apologize to that person. When, when you prayed for the solution and God actually speaks it into your life, we say, no, God. I, I'm wondering if, if that's not also in this passage. We're kind of double-minded. We say we have faith. We say we're going to believe. We say we're going to ask. And then we turn around and ask, and he gives us, gives us the answer. Then we turn right around with God, and we put our hand up, and we say to God, that can't possibly be the answer. We grab right a hold of the steering wheel and say, God, you, you're not driving in the right lane. Now, don't tell me, church, that you don't do that. Because I know I do. And I see many others that do in their lives as well. And so James starts off this letter, and, and in the midst of trials, he says, you need to consider it all joy that God's taking you on a journey, or allowing you at least to go on a journey. Don't worry about the journey so much. Worry about the destination, and, and consider it all joy that God's got this under control. And you look at this text, and you say, God, or Tom, how in the world does this apply to, to me today? Because everything that we're experiencing today, church, God's got it all, all figured out, frankly. I didn't say God's causing things. I didn't say any of that. I, but what, what I'm trying to express to you is that you got to trust that God can get you home from where he said he could get you home to. That he can drive it and make it work. Frida Lesher understood that lesson through the hardship of her life more than anybody that I'd ever met in my life. She understood that God was in control no matter what was happening. God was going to bring her home. She used to talk to me when we'd go to that nursing home. And she was 99 or 100 years old. And she kept, she'd say to me, say, Tom, I'm going to get a new body. You know that, right? God's going to give me a new body someday and I'm going to run and jump and play in heaven like I've never run and jumped and played before because God is in control of my life and he's been in control of my life for nearly 50 years now and she believed it. Church to you. Are you going to continue to let your life and your faith be fragile? Are you going to continue to, to let other things mold your faith or are you going to be willing to let God mold your faith? And in the midst of that molding, understand that, yes, you might be in a trial. Yes, you might be coming out of a trial. Yes, you might be going into a trial. But rest assured of this, God, if he is Lord of your life, God has this in control. And he's going to bring you to the destination that he desires for you. And you can trust that God will take care of you. Church, live your faith that way each day. Live your, your, your life in such a way that people see that, yes, that you are struggling. You don't have to hide your struggle, but live your life each day that people say, how does that individual have the attitude in which they have in the midst of the trial that they're going through? I think my mother was the probably greatest example of that in my life. She'd lost her first husband in the Korean War. She remarried after having a, a child from her first husband who she had this child as he was away in Korea. She remarried again and uh, two years after his death and uh, had my two older brothers. And then when she was pregnant with me, my real father was killed. Two years after that, she lost one of her own children. Somebody came to the house one day and uh, after the morning and stuff was going on and said, Betty, why do you think all these things are happening to you? And my mom's response, and I think it's deeply ingrained in myself and so many of my siblings, my mother's response was, why do you think this couldn't happen to me? Are you suggesting that because I've done something wrong that there's this cloud that hangs over me? No, this is just life. And it's life, and I'm going to endure it, and I'm going to see something on the other end of this, and my mother did. She lived her life to the fullest. She remarried a third time. She was the president of a school board. She had a, a radio show that she did for seven years. She did many things in her life. She did not let her circumstance define her. She did not let her trial define her. She, she chose to endure the trial. She chose to have joy as she went through life. And you can choose it too. Church, I pray that you'll be blessed today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that his blessing will come over you today. Live your life to the fullest. Trust in the Lord. Count it all joy. In Jesus' name, amen.